Welcome to the show. I guess we all dream of getting away from it all once in a while, but some of the people in tonight's program have gone so far away that they've ended up smack bang in the middle of nothing. They're the residents of some of the remotest, smallest, driest settlements in the world. The fetless camps of the Trans-Australia Line. Dotted across the Nullarbor, these tiny towns exist only to service the railway and exist only because of the railway. Everything comes by train, including supplies, which arrive in a supermarket on wheels known as the tea and sugar. In these tiny communities, the highlight of the day for the women is a visit to hospital. And when a travelling show comes to town, it's a really big event. If you get tired of the big smoke once in a while, and don't we all, you might be interested to get to know some people who have plenty of fresh air and very little else. The building of the Trans-Australia Line from Port Augusta to Kalgoorlie was an engineering feat the railways still liked to hang their hat on. It was a period in their history when things not only went to schedule, but even broke records. The project spawned a train, also called the Trans-Australia, and that paved the way for all desert trains through the region. But it was the Trans-Australia line which finally linked eastern and western Australia. Port Augusta has always been a railway town, but it was the Trans-Australia which wrote it into railway history. In the days of steam, the job and lifestyle were inseparable. And working for the railways in the early 1900s was almost as much a social commitment as a job. Not only was Port Augusta home to the Trans Australia, it was the base of all support for the people who kept the trans running, and that included a special train. In those days, the sense of isolation living in the desert along the line must have been overwhelming. And although the baker and the candlestick maker may have long gone, the butcher was replaced only in recent years by a supermarket on bogies. No worries. Is that all right? 
Well, it's not too bad. Yeah, you'll drink it. Alcoholic like you, you're not really particular, are you? These days, the special train is known as the tea and sugar, or the sugar for short. But it's still the lifeblood of workers taking care of the desert trains. When it pulls in at places like the Six House Settlement of Barton in outback South Australia, locals regard it as an appointment never to be broken. With the nearest city high-rise close to a thousand kilometres away, it's easy to see why the sugar is such a part of their lives. Yeah, what would you do without the tea and sugar? We would be buggered. It was real when they took the, uh, the old uh, butcher's van off. I reckon they made a big mistake there, but then again, that's railways. I never did. I don't buy those sort of disgusting magazines. Hey, is one of the fettlers camps established at various places along the desert line to house the people who maintain the track. It's earmarked for extinction, one of the towns which will disappear from the map as concrete sleepers reduce the need for track maintenance. That means the life of the tea and sugar may also be limited. Yeah, how would you react if they did close it down? Well, well, we'll start I'd be glad be... I could go down to Port Augusta every fortnight or something. <laughs> do a bit of cheaper shopping. It would be one hell of a big strike yet if they do they close it. That sort of contradiction between husband and wife sums up the dilemma of the train's future. A few years back, before the supermarket van, the trip across the Nullarbor took the sugar an epic five days. With the van, it's only a couple, and even the storeman, Ron Nickel, is pessimistic. Well, for one thing, I know that the butcher himself used to do a roaring trade with the butcher's van on, but um, I can only judge by the amount of orders that I, that I have on to dish out here now that's gone completely to the pack. Admittedly, there's not as many camps now either, but uh, in, in comparison, it's just not the same. Yeah, you think it lost a bit of character? For sure. You know, the butcher's van, it, it was old. People knew that it was coming. It was there. Um, admittedly, health reasons. <laughs> that probably wouldn't have gone down too well, but um, the butcher himself, he was, a, he was a character. You know, before the customer could come on, buy what he likes, see it all there, cut up but now it's just lost all its appeal. They, they order it and they just have to take potluck virtually. What sort of future do you think it's got? The sugar, not, not a great deal, I'm afraid. Um, they'll have to run some sort of service out here, but it'll probably end up like the North Line vans. It's just container vans and they ring through orders and it's all done up down in Port Augusta. For as long as it's been one of the desert trains, the tea and sugar has had no set times and often sits in sidings like the one at All Day, waiting for other trains to pass. All Day is now what Barton will become, a memory. 
Mind you, when VIP stopped for gimmicky publicity shots during the first trip on the Trans Australia in 1917, they couldn't have possibly foreseen a time when steam trains would be relics and concrete sleepers would all but have eliminated the need for maintenance outposts. While the settlement has gone, the all day area has always been important to Aboriginals out here. The word all day means a meeting place where water is obtainable. Not far away in the desert is the only permanent water hole between Port Augusta and Kalgoorlie. Aboriginal groups would walk hundreds of kilometres to meet here. So it made sense that Daisy Bates, the most famous pioneer social worker for Aboriginals in our history, made all day one of her bases. Daisy Bates was a woman who valued the chance to work unsung, away from the mainstream. But now the only people who see the monument to her are the crews of trains forced to wait on the all-day siding. Now jack it again and we'll put it back on the rail. The tea and sugar waits for all other trains. So the derailment of a Fetlers section car is simply a minor delay in her progress across an area rarely, if ever, considered by most Australians. The section car and fettlers only have to travel 30 kilometres to their base at Watson. This six house settlement, named after a former Prime Minister, like most of these outposts, is probably the most barren place on the line. A week or two without the tea and sugar and its most precious commodity would mean abandoning Watson. It also reinforces the argument for keeping the sugar, because a train of some sort, whatever the locals decide to call it, will always be needed to bring water to people servicing the desert trains. Out here, a cup full of rainwater in a year constitutes a wet season. What on earth do you do in Watson all day? Nothing, just go around haunting the neighbours. You always sort of live in each other's pockets a bit? Oh, a bit, not too much. If water's a necessity, the arrival of a new freezer is hardly a luxury. Summer temperatures in the 40s and even 50s make having a freezer as practical as catching fresh meat from the surrounding desert. At Watson, rabbit and kangaroo shooting are among the most worldly things a person can do. There's normally a few roos around. Yeah, yeah. And uh, how many would you get in a freezer like this? How long would you be able to keep them? Fair while. Is, what is it? In our small fridge, in the freezer compartment there, we've had two roos for three months in it. So what could you fit in this by comparison? <laughs> well, about three roos, a couple of dozen rabbits and a heap of other meat. What's the roo meat like, good? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's the only meat. In fact, it's almost literally the only meat, because not very long ago, geologically speaking, the Nullarbor was an ocean bed, and the resultant parched limestone supports very little obvious life. Human life becomes a little more obvious another hundred kilometres or so along the track at Cook. It would be nice to wax poetic about Cook and say it nestles into the surrounds. The fact is it sits on some of the flattest countryside on earth. So flat that it's one of the few places where the natural horizon can be seen on land. The Queen City is roughly the halfway mark on the trans and very much the pure railway town. No railway means no town. The tea and sugar isn't the only community service to visit Cook. Six or seven years ago, an Adelaide-based entertainment group started a tradition of annual visits. This year, it's the New Patch Theatre. Their simple philosophy, to bring entertainment where there is none. We'll all be checking out a room. We're gonna take real soon. We're waxing down our surfboards. We can't wait for 
Patches travelling theatre in its purest form, with a little help from the railways. Give them a brake van or two, a flat top to piggyback their van, a passing freight train, and the new patch theatre is on tour to Outback Australia. trucks and you're driving around from hotel to hotel or uh, caravan park to caravan park, you have to unload all your personal gear. Well, in this sort of setup, of course, you've got uh, your home is already there. It pulls up at the place you're performing at. You don't need to travel to work, step out of the train, take the stuff across to the hall or the school and set up and you're away.
For these theatrical nomads, being shunted from pillar to post is a familiar pastime. But every siding they're pushed into soon becomes home and production office. And we'll have years five through to ten. I think they have some kids from year ten here. How many kids is that? That uh, comes to about 30, 30, 32, something like that. But I'm going to put some chairs, a couple of rows of chairs behind the smaller kids because I think for the larger kids, if it's a, if it's a little kid's show, which your show is, um, I think it's a bit unfair for the big kids to kind of feel like they're yeah. part of that. So they're going to sit close in, but on chairs, OK, with the teachers. And they felt that they'd just take the fives out of that vertical one to five group. Hopefully there'll be a lot of parents Yes, the whole town's been invited to both shows. Whether the audience is the whole town or a much smaller group, the actors use the experience as much to learn themselves as to teach the kids. In fact, a little of both happens, especially when the play contains some sort of message in this case about the barriers between people. The different points of view are represented by the red and the blue. For the fettlers of Cook, life goes on much the same as 70 years ago. Early cold mornings giving way to very hot days. Unlike the settlements immediately east and west of it, Cook has a future which won't change dramatically, despite the introduction of concrete sleepers. In the future, they'll continue to service the line, but for hundreds of kilometres in each direction. In the meantime, the hard slog of replacing the old wooden sleepers goes on. What is it that brings someone like you out here? Lots of money around. <laughs> Must be better ways of making a quiz. 
Oh, yeah, there is. Can you find it? <laughs> I reckon. <laughs> it's better yeah, than that right. here. What do you think of being out here? Oh, I enjoy it. Yeah, it's, I've always been in the you know, bushy, I suppose, a little stick kid. I don't like working in cities. I tried it for oh, a couple of years down in Melbourne. And it was too much of a rat race. I was just uh, <laughs> out of this joint and back to the bush. Can you stay out and cook much longer? Oh, I could, yeah. Uh, the thing is, I've got a promotion chance coming up. And if that comes up, well, I'll be gone from here that quick again. <laughs> what would it take to keep you in cook? Promotion. You'd stay here then? Yeah. If I can get the same chances here and cook as what I can get elsewhere, I'll stay here. You first your own boss out here. You can, uh, oh, right, you've got a road master, he says you've got to go out and do such and such a job. But you come out here and you, know, you get your job done and that's it. There's nothing crazy in a bloke that lives at Cook, right? This is right. Don't have to be crazy, just help. Yeah, like, how long have you been here, Ernie? Eh? Eight and a half years. And you're willing to stay longer? Yeah, another five years, I reckon. Yeah? Doesn't drive you crazy? Oh, you've got to be mad to be out here, but it's all right. What's your Sorry. family do? Uh, nothing much, really. My wife does housework. Um, kids go to school. Have a lot of fun. It's good, good life out here because you got no pollution, you got nothing out here. Just clean air. Beautiful. Okay, lads, that's it. Back to it. It must be one of the most unlikely shopping centres in the world an old caravan parked by the line at Cook Railway Station. The Trans Australia is on time, although at six o'clock in the morning, souvenir shopping isn't everyone's priority. That's a pity because it produces a gut sense of isolation which many passengers still don't experience. The remoteness they've slept through and woken up to is nullified by stainless steel walls. Travelling time across the Nullarbor has improved by roughly a day since diesel power did away with the need to take on coal and water. Yet many of the locos, like this Clyde-built GM class, built in the early 50s, are older than some steam engines delivered to the railways. So perhaps it's fair to argue, as many do, 
that air conditioning has been the only major improvement in comfort. Life on the trans has always consisted of eating, sleeping, sitting, and maybe looking at the occasional wildlife. Distance becomes meaningless. It's not surprising to find that locos like old GM5 have clocked well over 5 million kilometres, pulling pretty much the same predictable loads into Kalgoorlie Station over the years. Kalgoorlie is one of several places on the rails around Australia with something of a Wild West flavour. With the discovery of gold, authorities were quick to build a rail link with Perth, but only narrow gauge. The Trans-Australia line made it important as the changeover point for through passengers. Today, it exists for the same two things, the mines and the railways. But it's famous for two others, two up and brothels. Certainly there's a lot more to the place than passengers from the Trans will see in a half hour bus tour. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the twin towns of Kalgoorlie and Boulder. My name's Pete Smith. In the short time we have available to us this evening, we'll endeavour to have a look at some of the attributes of the two towns. We have here a combined population of some 23,000 people, making us the largest regional centre outside the metropolitan area of Perth. Yet Kalgoorlie has managed to fossilise life from its early days. It's changed hotel to our right, standing pretty much as it did when it was first constructed at the turn of the century. The old Australian over on the opposite corner, recently having won an award for its restoration. Now the Town Council of Kalgoorlie is quite insistent that if storekeepers wish to remodel their stores, they can do so by all means, but they must keep the original facade of their buildings. A lot of famous people have spent considerable time here in, in Kalgoorlie. One of them, of course, being C.Y. O'Connor, the gentleman responsible for the construction of the pipeline bringing the water from Perth. Also a chap by the name of Hoover spent his late teens, early 20s here in the goldfields before returning to the United States and taking up a political career. Of course, I refer to Herbert Hoover. He was in charge of quite numerous people here in the goldfields during his early teens and showed his leadership qualities at a very early age. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're now entering Hay Street. It's the location of the houses of the repute. The occupants are, are strictly nocturnal. Don't become active until the sun goes down. You should see some of them operative. There was a time when the prostitutes of Hay Street weren't even allowed into the town proper. The unwritten rules of Kalgoorlie still forbid them to enter hotels or the drive-in theatre and insist that local girls don't work there. Of course, it's an illegal operation in occupation. Then again, the police station's only a couple of hundred metres further along in the same street. The social and moral division is as defined as Kalgoorlie by night and Kalgoorlie by day. Of course, Kalgoorlie is responsible for the production of half of Australia's known output of gold and reported it the richest piece of earth in the world. The present rule of thumb statement is that for every ounce of gold currently produced here in Kalgoorlie, further known reserves of some two ounces are being discovered. Modern technology has also given a special urgency to the treatment of old diggings and waste dumps. It's methodical and profitable, yielding 95% of gold from the ore, where old timers could manage only 60% first time round. So far, 35 million ounces have been mined here, and such was the power of gold in Kalgoorlie's first 10 years, it boosted the state's population fourfold. Over a hundred hotels sprang up here, four times as many as today. And it all started with a chance find by a man called Paddy Hannon, whose statue sits unobtrusively in a corner of town, doubling rather ironically as a water fountain. When Paddy found the gold that started the rush, he and his mates were ready to leave because they'd run out of water. Many other diggers perished because they refused to accept that around Kalgoorlie, a water bag could be more precious than the metal they sought. What Paddy Hannon started has gone full circle, through bad times and back to good. And in a town which is dominated by the big conglomerates, the one-man enterprise still abounds. There's still plenty of room for modern-day Paddies, like Harry Boucher, the doyen of local prospectors. He spent most of his life fossicking around the diggings of Kalgoorlie and nearby Coolgardie. In the last few years, he's even accepted that modern gadgets like his metal detector, or magic wand as he calls it, now have their place in the goldfields.
not a bad little nugget, Harry, is it? It's a bloody beauty. That's the value of these things, is it? Oh, yeah. Where does, uh, where does panning come in? What's the difference between panning and using one of these? Well, panning uh, is you're looking for gold that you can't see. See, gold that's imprisoned in the rocks. Sometimes, if it's very rich, when you uh, go over it with a detector, with a rock, like over the rock, you'll, you'll get a recording. But uh, Which way do you prefer? Oh, the dolly. That means panning? Yeah, yeah. See, uh, you get a mine out of it, but out of uh, alluvial, you won't get no mine. Once you've taken the alluvial out, well, it's gone. It's finished, and it's only in the top six inches, normally. But if you uh, get it out of the rock, well, she could go down two or 3,000 feet. Harry's best single find doesn't even rate with the big ones. It was 93 ounces yielded from 17 tonnes of ore dug in one afternoon. I was driving a, uh, the first backhoe that came to the gold fields. And uh, I had the block, pegged the block there, so I put a trench down <laughs> with this backhoe. Yeah, well, I was supposed to be working for some, you know, on some other job. Anyhow, I sampled all the bottom of the trench and got nothing. Then up the sides and I got nothing. So I got a post hole digger and I bored it into the side of the trench. And bang, there she was. That's how close you can go to it. If I hadn't put the post hole digger in, I'd have never have found it. I forget now just exactly what I, uh, what profit I got. About 1,500 quid, I think, altogether. That's equivalent to a good year's wages these days, but for Harry, merely striking a claim has been just as symptomatic of the Kalgoorlie fever, which grabs hold early and hangs on forever. So, there's only 30 there. While two-up is Australia's traditional gambling game with obscure origins around the settlement period, the miners of Kalgoorlie made it their own game six days out of seven. The seventh day was payday in the mines, and two-up was declared strictly taboo in order to give their women folk a chance to get a share of the pay packet. That tradition remains today. Fifty dollars each. And even though it became legal here a couple of years ago, it's still as unpretentious as when it was illegal and needed to be low-key. Now tourists have discovered that in Kalgoorlie, copper can also mean gold. Well, sometimes anyway. And they've provided a fresh source of money for the country's most famous two-up game. The rules haven't changed perceptibly since the turn of the century. Most gambling is on the side, with players betting amongst themselves dollar for dollar. A huge supply of old pennies has been kept since the changeover to decimal currency to keep the game fair dinkum. Locals call it the fairest gamble of them all. Because it's an even money game, and there's not much take to it. There's not much, you know, no one takes much money out of it. Uh, it's really only the men that are spinning that pays you. Know, they pay 10% commission. And the others, you can bet the tail or head on the side and cost you nothing. To make a good two-up player, you've got to be able to think ahead. You, you know the game, you know the players, you know the spinners, and uh, you've got to sort of be able to concentrate. Uh, if, if you're a hothead and just play stupid, well, you'll do your money. But if you can control yourself, you've got a big chance of a two-up score. It's late in the day and the crowd is thinning out. Money's getting short. The winners have left. But players also know that with sunset comes the end of a day's play. It always has. These days the game is played a little out of town. But it started near the railway line in the Golden Mile. Miners used to catch trains to the game, not far from Boulder Station. You can't go far in Kalgoorlie without crossing a railway line. 
In fact, this funny little tourist train operates on what was once the busiest network in West Australia. The whole town built up around Kalgoorlie's Loop Line Railway. The station here at Boulder City was once much larger and miners of a different kind piled onto commuter trains which worked the Loop Line. It opened in 1897. During shift changes at the mines, there was a train every couple of minutes servicing 12 stations. Most of them have gone and the loop shape is no longer intact, but some of the line is being restored. While that happens, tourists can travel on what must rank as one of the most innovative trains in the world, made up from two track inspection vehicles, roughly 40 years old, and a goods trailer, all pulled by a former jetty shunting locomotive, good old Z1153. Golden Gate, now the northern terminus of the line, was once the busiest railway station in West Australia, even busier than Perth. Now driver Elaine Glennie regards it as simply a convenient place to turn around. With a little help from husband Fred, who drives much bigger locos for a living. This whole area was once a mixture of miners' camps and shanty towns, and in the Depression years, the scene of fighting between police and miners in what became known as the Riot of Dingbat Flat. It's an area which would have been largely forgotten historically, but for the determination of the Golden Mile Loop Line Railway Society. What do you think you learned from being on the loop line? Um, we learned about how they travelled and what they did around and how they had to find food and how it was so hard to look for the gold and things like that. Any other comment from the new generation of Kalgoorlians would be a disappointment. Since their town came to prominence as the end of the Trans-Australia line, they've wanted nothing to change. They want nothing to change. Now, there's a contented attitude, which you rarely find in big cities. I guess they've got more out there than meets the eye. Thanks for joining me. See you next week. Good night.